guys and welcome to episode 234 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode I got on Thomas Smalley to talk about his OCD story and in 2019 he won the International OCD Foundation's Hero Award for his advocacy services and initiatives. Uh, so it was great to, to get him on to talk about that experience and to get to know his story better. And he goes into plenty of detail and depth. Uh, he also talks about getting therapy, dealing with shame, tracking progress in therapy, his experience of teletherapy, how physical exercise and faith were helpful outlets for him, finding his identity after he got his time back after reducing compulsions, uh, talk about dealing with stigma, words of hope and much, much more. So thank you as always to you guys for listening. I really appreciate it and I really appreciate Thomas's time to share his story. And a quick shout out to our podcast partners, NoCD. NoCD Therapy matches you with a licensed therapist trained to treat OCD, offers a personalized treatment plan delivered through face-to-face video therapy sessions. Between therapy sessions, you can use their therapeutic tools in the app 24-7, message your therapist, and learn what helps other people in their OCD peer community. To find out more, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. Now on to the show. On the podcast today, I have Thomas Smalley, who has kindly agreed to share his story with us. Welcome to the show, Thomas. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. Um, As you know, uh, I like to hear people's OCD stories, so in as little or as much detail as you want to give, it would be good to hear that. Yeah, so my OCD story, um, it started when I was, you know, it started when I was probably 12 and I was kind of having um, some different thoughts and different and dealing with the dealing with these compulsions, but then kind of not realizing what it was until I was about 15. And I started doing my own personal research on what was going on because at the time I was spending 12 to 14 hours a day doing compulsions and I was just you know, as OCD does, just was just debilitating my life. So what I was doing was just uh, kind of looking online, like what, like, does anybody have these kind of symptoms? Like, what is, is it only me? What's wrong with me? And then I finally kind of brought it up to my parents. And at first they didn't, I mean, I, we didn't, we all didn't really know what OCD was. And because I think, especially you go back, that's like 10 years ago. Hmm. In just in ten years, how much has come out about OCD and how much how destigmatized it's, it's been. So I think, especially ten years ago, a decade ago, that was very uh, it was just taboo to talk about and just kind of like a brush off. And finally, I got to the point where I, I couldn't leave the house. My OCD was just completely running me down. It was my probably my sophomore year of high school and my parents came, came to me and said, all right, we need, I see there's some, there's some, whatever it is, there's something going on. We need to get you some help. And I mean, I was really blessed to have great, great support system with family. My brother uh, is two years older than me. um, And he was, he's been my best friend my whole life. So that was good to have him. Um, But even for him, like he was kind of scared didn't know what was going on and you know they can only understand it from their per- level of perception because they don't have it so they're trying to do their best and but my parents did really were really diligent and really uh, forceful about getting me help and and I did try like two different therapists before I found the one I'm currently with who I've been with for six years now um, and the first two just didn't you know there's such a important treatment for OCD as we know ERP and the, uh, the combination between medication and exposure response therapy definitely saved my life and the first two therapists that I saw didn't didn't weren't trained in ERP and so you, it's great to do talk therapy when you have OCD and get things out but when you can't do exposures mm. the OCD anxiety is not going to go down and I finally got to Amy Common, who's in uh, Westport, Connecticut, and she was, uh, I consider her like family now. She does, she did in-home visits for me. She would actually come to the house 
and because I didn't want to leave. Mm. And she would do exposure therapy, and then we'd talk about it. And, you know, that started really helping. Then I went started going to her office. And I was seeing her about two, three times a week. And I think that really was the turning point in the idea of, uh, me, of me actually recovering and living a life that was worth living one um, because I was definitely at the point of suicidal ideation and not wanting to even get out of bed or, or do anything anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, with OCD, there's a lot of depression and anxiety that comes with it, and that was kind of that was kind of really settling in and just really overtaking me. So I think I think uh, the combination of the medication and the ERP definitely t kind of turned my life around and made me realize that you know it's not going to be easy every day. And you know, even to even I was just talking to my mom this week about how I was on a I been I since I got to college I FaceTime my therapist now um, because I can't see her in person because I'm away from home and now with the COVID nineteen situation going on there every therapist is pretty much doing uh, teletherapy so I was talking to my mom just the other day and I was telling her what I have to do for exposure homework this this week I have on my wall in my room like right next to me is a is a, is a chart. And I've been charting my anxiety and I have the anxiety hierarchy and, you know, things I did seven years ago to start out when I was at my absolute worst, I'm still doing today. So that, that just because, you know, I'm able to advocate and I'm able to, to, you know, aside from like my advocacy efforts, I'm a strength coach and working in athletics just because I'm able to do that stuff beneath the surface i'm still i'm still i'm still very very challenged with it and i i still have to overcome all those uh those daily challenges so it's just a um my my story ocd is i i think the best way to put it is still ongoing you know i think a lot of people think you're going to go to therapy and take medication and it's just going to be over there's it's chronic and when I, I i find when i don't keep at that maintenance i think my last semester of college i was kind of like not doing as much exposure and, and kind of saying, All right, I'll just do this one compulsion and it's it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But that makes it spiral. So it's really important to stay on top of the maintenance. But my OCD story has taken me a lot of different places. Um, I've been lucky since when I started therapy. Um, I was probably midway through my junior year and – Amy asked me to speak at a service, uh, a awareness event at the Yale Child Study Center in New Haven, which is close to my home because I'm from Fairfield, Connecticut. And I, I agreed, didn't really know what to expect. And there was only about 40 people there. But I just told my story of what I had to do with, with, with my OCD. And it was reciprocated very well. And that led to me going to the national conference, speaking there. And then it kind of took off from there. Uh, I've spoken at, you know, five plus conferences now and I spoke at SUNY Cobble Skill last summer. So I've been able to, in a way, you know, I, I really try to look at the whole OCD journey mm. with some positivity because it's brought me really close, cl close relationships within the OC, IOCDF community and it's brought me things that I didn't think I was, I knew I was capable of. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and yeah, how, how has kind of doing the public speaking and speaking at conferences helped you personally with your OCD, if at all? Yeah, I think it definitely helps with my OCD just because even when you just affect one person, you have one person that comes up to you and says, I deal with this, just knowing somebody else on this earth deals with what you're dealing with, it just makes you feel that much less alone. And I think that has helped me when just advocating, you know, sharing my story and realizing that there is a whole community out there. And, you know, now you're now all of a sudden you're a part of all these Facebook groups, these e these uh, email threads, these group messages. And now you have that community. I think if I didn't advocate, I would still be kind of alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. And that really has helped me. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and when you. So going back to when you first got therapy and you were kind of housebound at that point, um, 
were you in a place where you wanted therapy or were you kind of against it? I think at first I was against it because of the shame. I, I felt embarrassed mm. and I felt ashamed of my OCD. But then, you know, I had these lofty goals of going to college, uh, you know, different things that I wanted to do with my life. And, real, and then it was so – OCD was so debilitating that I realized – I don't really want to do the therapy, but I think it's at this, I was like, at this point I have to, like mm-hmm. something has to give, I have to do something. Otherwise I'm going to waste my life away. And it's just not going to, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be here when I'm 25. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think I was reluctant, but n- knew it in my, in my heart that I needed the therapy. Yeah. Which is tough because I know, I know. So I've met so many people that, especially even at the, uh, at the IOCDF national conferences, when I speak, I'll meet people that come up to me after and I'm like, are you in exposure response therapy? And they don't want to go. Hmm. And that's, that's really, or I'll have parents come up to me and, and say, how do I get my child to go to therapy? They don't want to. And I can't imagine that. That's really tough because until you get to that therapy, until you start doing it, the anxiety really can't go down too much. Hmm. Um, so the the first the, I think the first biggest step step in OCD recovery is acceptance and kind of realizing it's necessary. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that because I you know I've had similar questions before of you know my my partner or my son or daughter doesn't want therapy. You know how do yeah. I get them there? And it's like that's you know a tough question. And I know there are um, private practices and inpatient services that work specifically with people who are resistant but i mean right. i'm always kind of on the lookout for anyone who is hesitant and can share kind of what changed for them right um, yeah i think when i get questions like that because i'm not a professional a medical yeah. professional or someone that can work with people that are resistant but what i try to do is just highlight how much therapy has helped me you know what i mean because maybe maybe if there's a chance they hear how much it helped me they realize okay it maybe it's not such a bad thing to go to hmm absolutely yeah you're right sharing your own story and own journey and your feelings within that story can be very helpful for people especially if they're battling shame and stuff like that right um so when you started then in therapy um how long was it before you started to change maybe some of your views on some of that self-stigma maybe if i can use that word or, or any shame around it right i think it was kind of when I started speaking that I started realizing that, you know, I can build a platform and I have a platform as somebody that deals with it mm-hmm. and realizing that like me- there is no shame in mental illness. You know, we don't, my favorite line that I forget where I heard it, but I'm, I mean, my mom says it all the time. We don't, we don't say like, we don't make fun of somebody with a broken arm or with a immune deficiency, like a mm-hmm. immune system deficiency or like a, a disease. But when it's something that's inside your brain and something that people ne- might not necessarily be able to see, there's all of a sudden this stigma around it. And realizing that I could make a difference and kind of shifting that stigma away and pushing that away kind of gave me the the idea that there's not shame. It's just misunderstanding about mm. it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, thank you for that. That that. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And with the the wall chart, you said where you track your exposures and you track your anxiety. Um, yeah, is that something your therapist suggested, or is this something you've kind of come up on your own? Yeah, that was I. That was something my therapist uh, deserves full credit for. She definitely. Hmm. The first thing we did when in therapy, I remember when I was a when I was in high school was she she made me have make a list of all my obsessions that I was having. And obviously obsessions, they change. I mean, my obsessions in high school were a lot different than my obsessions now. Uh, For some people, it stays the same. Some people, they change every month, every year, every week. It's just kind of, you know, OCD is just going to latch on to whatever whatever it can. Hmm. Whatever matters most to you, that's what OCD is going to usually latch on to. And so I just had to kind of make a list of my compulsions and my obsessions and then we would make a list of which ones would be the hardest to do an exposure for and then lowest to highest in difficulty. And then we would kind of just check them off as we go. 
Yeah. And, you know, some weeks I might not get one. Hmm. Some weeks it was too hard to do to even do one. But some weeks I would do like three exposures in a week and, and you know, that that really became productive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, one of my favorite sayings is what gets measured gets managed. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for def- sure definitely in my own life if i measure something I- i'm on top of it much more than if right I'm not. exactly and i think that, uh, yeah. right measuring it is like maybe it doesn't make that doesn't alone doesn't make the anxiety go away but mm. it keeps you accountable in yes. doing the therapy at least and Absolutely. having that kind of sense of because you know i know for me with my ocd it hates uncertainty it hates not having control over situations and having control over how I treat my OCD definitely helps in my recovery. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and you said you, well, obviously now you're doing teletherapy because we kind of have to, because yeah. we, we can't get out. Um, but you were doing that anyway at, at college. Um, yeah. And then you obviously before went to your therapist's office. I guess just for people that may be wary of teletherapy, have you, what's your experience been like compared to being in the office with your therapist? Right. It was something to get used to. Mm. And I don't, I don't think it was something on my therapist side. I think it was more on my side. Okay. I think bringing me to an office kind of made me like really be very present in the moment. And there was nowhere else to look around or go mm. or no distractions. I think that kind of, um, I took it a little more seriously when I would be in the, in the office. Hmm. And then when I got, when I got on FaceTime, my fir- my freshman year of college, I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Like blah, 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 blah. Like kind of rushing it away. And then I realized I can't do that because I started go kind of backpedaling a little bit and realized if I don't take it seriously on FaceTime, it's, it's the same effect. I'm going to, it's going to, it's going to, it's not going to end well for me. I'm going to, I'm going to have, end up having more anxiety my OC is going to come creeping back in. So it's just definitely something to get used to. But, you know, I would do it every week. And after a while, I just made sure there's like some, there's a few guidelines that I would say, like, make sure you have a quiet sp- space. Can't emphasize that enough. Mm-hmm. Make sure you have somewhere where even if it's a 30 minute session, you're, you know, nobody's coming in, nobody's going to be around you. And for me, that was like, there was like a, a study room in a library where no, like I could, I could book it like through a library for an hour and I could go to that study room and just having the accountability of going somewhere else to get, to do the therapy. I think that helps not just like answering the phone in my bed, that kind of thing. So I think, uh, I think you, it teaches you to be a little more responsible and a little bit more. Uh, it's more of a, I think, I mean, therapy in general, in the, the ERP in general is more, is most of you get what you put into it, you know? Yeah. I think that goes for, for most things in life. You know, you get, you get what you put into things, but if you, if you are willing, it works. Yeah. It is, no. it is different though. It is different. Yeah. And for, for, for a while I didn't, I didn't love it, but my alternative was go to the counseling center at school Hmm. where they're probably not ERP trained and you know I would have to start over and tell my whole whole life story again you know Amy knew me so well and knew everything that I had been through so and you know I missed talking to her if I didn't so I I I felt like it was best to just try the teletherapy and it's worked out yeah now I appreciate you sharing that um just for anyone that is unsure um yeah because they are different but I know the outcomes of the effectiveness can be very similar. Um, right. Everyone has their preference, right? Um, yeah, I know. I, I definitely prefer to be in a room with someone just because I like Me the too. human connection. Yeah. But doing therapy recently over, you know, as we're kind of speaking now, um, it, it took some getting used to, but it's it's still useful and helpful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with exposure to, you know, if it was just talk therapy, it might be a little bit easier, but exposure is very hands-on, right? So we're doing stuff and and making like hierarchies. So what Amy does a lot of, uh, which which helped quickly was uh was kind of get we make that chart and we'd still do what we did in the office, but then I'd have to report 
to her throughout the week. So that just so that like there's 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 benchmarks each week that I need to hit so that I know again just accountability. Yeah. No, that's that's useful. Thank you. Um okay, so you know, therapy, medication, is there anything else you do that helps with kind of your general mental health? I mean, for me training, uh strength and conditioning, you know, I'm a strength coach. Um Studying, I'm going to get my master's at Merrimack in exercise and sports science. Um, so I think for me, um, lifting and, and and training is definitely that's where I put my my energy and my time um, outside of my advocacy efforts, and um, that that definitely, in a way, saved my life. Um, just having that hour to my to myself of tr- of training and just being me and a barbell like that, that kind of was, a uh, of the, one of the biggest factors in kind of, uh, driving me away from, you know, suicidal ideation in addition to the therapy and the, uh, and the, and the medic, uh, medication working out and training was definitely one thing that really, uh, really pushed me. Um, it felt it was, it was a time, it was, it was a time where I could push myself to my, to my limits in a good way and um to this day you know every day that's that's one of that's one of that's one of the highlights of my day every day so yeah um that and then also my faith you know ocd definitely did attack my religion mm-hmm. you know it it definitely uh gave me some scrupulosity and uh it definitely did uh attack my faith but you know after i'm working with amy on that you know i've I think if anything, I've grown in my faith. Um, and I think that that definitely has helped me too. That's awesome. No, thank you for that. Um, so, I mean, I think yeah. everybody's going to have different outlets, but yeah. like, it's important to find those outlets. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Fine. Because if you're just focusing on therapy and mm. then coming home and just thinking about ruminating and about your OCD, it's just, it's good to find different outlets. But then also, you know, you have to make sure those OCD doesn't creep into those outlets either. Yes. But because it obviously it does affect things that are important to you. So you just got to make sure you're on top of the maintenance of OCD too. Absolutely. And yeah, and as, as you go for therapy and you're starting to do less compulsions, you're getting more of your life back and more time right, back. Right. So you want to fill that time with stuff that's meaningful to you and fun. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, like I like I said earlier, you know, twelve to fourteen hours a day of compulsions, yeah. you know, it, it left me ten hours, 10, 10 to twelve hours to sleep, yeah. do my homework, whatever. I wasn't getting to do a lot of things I like to do. So then, I think a lot of people with OCD, I know myself included, it was honestly kind of a slap in the face when I realized, wow, I have, even when I got it down to like four hours of compulsions, I was like, I have eight more hours to do things I want to do. Like, mm. what do I even like? Like, what's my identity? And I think, like, for a while, I, I really did, until about my sophomore, junior year of college, until that's, that's when I, you know, that's when I started working for my, my uh, strength coach mentor at, at Siena, and he uh, kind of brought out my passion of strength and conditioning. That was kind of, up until that point, I didn't really know my identity and what I loved. And I think that's happened to a lot of my friends that, that have OCD, that I've met that have OCD. Um, and a lot of the community that I have, they get all this time back and they say like, who am I? Right. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think there's always people trying to figure out who they are, even when they don't have OCD, but then you add in when you didn't really have your life because OCD overtook it and you get it, you start getting it back and you're, you know, you, you have to go through some self discovery a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It can be tricky. Um, Okay, so um, next question is around dealing with stigma. So I know you you faced definitely an uphill battle with this uh, at college. And just, yeah, whatever you want to share about that and just any words of wisdom, I guess, for people kind of facing similar battles. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, I can't talk about everything that occurred. You know, it's yeah. uh, I, I dealt with a situation that, was something that I wish, you know, nobody else ever has to deal with. Um, you know, someone I trusted 
who I thought I trusted, you know, started to make fun of my mental illness when I confided in them. And it got to the point where they were saying things that shouldn't be said to another human being, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not, you know, I'm, I was looked at when I, by some people as a millennial or soft when I, when I stood up for myself because I was not, I was getting bullied and kind of belittled, I would say, not kind of, I was definitely getting belittled <laughs> uh, about my OCD and that, you know, some people saw me as soft for standing up, but to me, it's called character and integrity. Like we, I wouldn't make fun of someone with physical illness. I shouldn't be made fun of because I have a mental illness and I definitely shouldn't be made fun of by someone that I confided in and thought I trusted. So it was just a, it was a tough, it was really tough for me. Um, luckily I had good, other good people around, um, like my strength coach mentor, coach Ian, um, that kind of took me under his wing during that time. But Sigma is, is stigma with mental illness and OCD is tough because, you know, the person thought I, they were just bantering with me, but that, but they knew they were well aware what they were saying was way out of line. Yeah. And, you know, it felt isolating. I didn't expect to be kind of thrown into that situation, especially as a, a 20 year old kid. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was still really young. I'm, I, the difference between me at 20 and, and now at almost 23 is very different. You know, that's huge developmental stage. And, um, it was really, really tough. There were, t there were times where my, not only did it feel so is isolated, but I was kind of thrown back into my OCD relapsing and I, I had to go home for a few weeks during that time. Um, just because I couldn't deal with the, the constant ab abuse and, you know, the stigma with OCD is, has been so uh, consistent mm. for the past 30 years, you know, Monk, the different TV shows, you know, so they think it's something quirky or something cute, but it's really just debilitating. Yeah. And for a while I was kind of, I was, I, I felt like it was kind of a why me situation. I was like, well, I can, I can, I stood up for myself and I don't know why this happened to me, but. I started flipping around and okay, now I have a platform, right? Now I have a platform where pe where, pe where people can listen and I can give people hope. And I think that's the best thing to do about, you know, stigma. Um, when I first started dealing with OCD or when I, when I started going through, through therapy, I was kind of like, why me? And I was kind of throwing a little pity party, which in my Italian family, you don't do, you don't do pity parties. And, I, I said, I finally kind of flipped it around. Once I started getting a, a little bit better with therapy and a little more consistent with my approach um, and kind of believing what that I could get better, I kind of flipped it around and said, okay, like, why not me, right? You know, I could educate people. I can flip the script on OCD. I can help be a pioneer of ushering in this new wave of understanding mental illness and, and, uh, being sensitive to, to people's uh, disabilities. And I think that kind of helped me and prepared me for this situation unknowingly, but mm -hmm. when I did get to this situation where I wasn't be being treated fairly and you know, I made the decision to stand up for myself and I had to know that there wasn't gonna only be positive outcomes out of that, right? That's, you know, when we speak about mental illness, you know, when I made my documentaries, I can't expect everyone to be like, rah, rah, Tommy, like, mm -hmm. you're so great. Thanks for standing up. There's going to be negativity. There's going to be people trying to bring you down. There's going to be tr people making fun of you. And that was something as an advocate, I had to learn the hard way with this, with the whole situation I went through. Um, but I wouldn't trade the lessons I, I learned from that whole situation for anything hmm. you know I, it brought me closer to certain people and it made me realize who i can trust and who might not who might not be there for me in the end and that's okay um there's always going to be people that try to bring you down and and a lot of those lessons were really 
hard lessons to learn, but definitely worth learning. Hmm. Um, and I think the whole situation, you know, it made me a better advocate and more of a uh, open-minded person about realizing that some people are ignorant and you can only educate them as much as you can. And if they don't accept that, that's on them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I can't, I can't worry about if I, if I, if I give everything I have to advocacy and they don't want it, that's their, that's their own prerogative. Yeah. And that was something that I had to learn. And unfortunately, a lot of people have been really reciprocal and really received the, the information I advocate about. And it's been, I mean, I've had, I've, I've met so many, I've made so many different positive relationships in my life now because of the IOCDF, um, just like truly the most amazing foundation. But, you know, some people at school or some people back home, some people in the news, um, reporters, like they don't want to hear about OCD or, or they think it's still something quirky, but mm-hmm. we can only, we can only educate them as much as we can. And they have to either want to learn or they're just going to stay ignorant. But even if you're, even if you were, re- my thing was with, especially with my documentaries and my advocacy effort was, even if I reached one person, that's, I didn't do it to reach thousands of people. I didn't think I would. Hmm. You know, I was very fortunate that I had, I had that platform and that it, it, it made it so that pe- it could reach more people than I, than I actually had thought I would. But I was so fortunate that I was even affecting one person because that's one more person that we're educating. That's one more person that when they hear someone else say, I'm so OCD, I'm so, uh, I love everything to be clean, then they stand up. So and then it's just, a, you know, it's, it takes one person to stand up for another person. And it, it, it really is a snowball. So mm. I think that don't get into advocacy if, and, and breaking down stigma if you're just trying to reach mass millions at a time, right? We all had our start with advocacy yeah. and it's brick by brick. We're not going to be able to just throw everybody in the world in a room and, and say, here's the deal. Yeah. We got to keep building it. And I think you can have high, high expectations for it, for the outcomes, but you have to understand that some people might not receive it the best. And, um, that was something that I kind of had to deal with throughout college. Hmm. Yeah. Very wise. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, thank you for also sharing your experience. I'm sure it's not easy to kind of relive it. Um, yeah. Okay. So you you mentioned it there, your documentary. Um, yeah, just tell us about that, you know, what, it, what it's about, why you did it and you know, how people can find it. Yeah. So, uh, I made, I collaborated with a friend of mine. He's, he, uh, does film for a lot of athletic teams at Siena and then does a little bit, uh, of photography and, uh, you know, freelance shooting. And he, he was interested in documentary video and I was really fortunate. His name's Brian Herat. And he, uh, I pitched an idea to him. I was like, I want to start advocating outside of my speaking at, at the national conferences. Would you be interested in making a, a short clip about OCD? I did not think he was going to go, you know, full, uh, guns blazing, like making this, uh, incredible documentary about like a really, really raw documentary about OCD, but he was all in. And I mean, I'm so grateful that he, he really took the time and, and effort, effort to, to put that all together. I mean, it's, it was, it was awesome. So he agreed and we started shooting th- stuff and kind of just thinking, brainstorming ideas. And I released it in March of my sophomore year of college. Um, and I, at the time I didn't know the situation that I was going to be in Mm. that we had just talked about previously. Um, and you know, that brought a lot of attention to the documentary, which 
I guess, was a, a good thing because it, it, it spread the, the documentary more, which meant more people were getting educated, but it also threw me into a spotlight I was not ready for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, was, I was just doing it for, one, for just the IOCDF to see that I was trying to, to, to help them in, in the fight against stigma and trying to break down those barriers, barriers, but then also really to educate people at school. Um, a lot of people didn't understand OCD, and so the video ended up getting. I mean, I think it has like seven thousand views now. Hmm. Um, and we've made two. We made a sequel after that. So I mean, together they have about ten thousand. And I mean, they are long videos. Like they're between 20 and 30 minutes each of them so to have 10,000 views total is pretty awesome and I was I was I mean I was so so thankful for everybody that took the time to watch a long video like that but the, I mean Brian did an incredible job you can find him on the YouTube page uh, struggle into strength and I think they're worth the watch because you know it, it gives a look into a really raw uh, open look into what a, a life with OCD is. Um, it gives a look into ERP. Uh, it gives a look into you know what it was like for my family to have to deal with, um, or not to deal with, to cope with mm-hmm. the the idea that I was you know suicidal and that I I was having so much trouble with even getting out of bed. So I think you know. It was something that honestly made me do more self-discovery, and um, it was helpful to me, me even just uh, realizing that, you know, I'm not, I'm far from from recovered. You know, I like recovered to me is such a word that like is thrown around. Like, oh, when you're recovered, like, yeah, I'm functional. You know, I'm I'm doing okay. I'm gonna live my life, and and I, I'm gonna keep battling, but like. I, I like, I still struggle, you know, I think that was something afterwards that like people kind of saw me and were like, Oh, like he's all, he's all better now. Like, and that to me, that was kind of hard, especially, I know we will dive into this later about the hero award, but when I won that award, I mean, I was so honored and it was, that night was incredible. Um, but you know, after the conference, I kind of felt this weird sense of like, like I have to be perfect now. Yeah. And you know, I I talked to my therapist about that that the week I got back, I said like I feel like I have to I have to be perfect and recovered every day now. And mm-hmm. that's not what the OCD, IOCDF wants. Like you know, they want someone that's authentic and and realizes that this is life lifelong and it's a battle. And that's when I started realizing that okay, like I don't need to be I don't need to be a poster boy for OCD recovery. You know, I need to show people that it's a journey. It's a, it's a process and you still have to work at it. Even when, even when you're, you aren't at your worst, there's still going to be bad days. There's still going to be good days. You know, it's, it's up and down. So I think that also is really seen in my, in my videos as well. So I think, uh, you know, they're definitely worth the watch and it was, I don't really, I think, my mom sent me a, there's a cool video on, on YouTube that I had seen about OCD. And I think that's when I kind of got the idea and I was, um, you know, the timing of it was, uh, good and bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot of attention and I'm not one to, to love a lot of attention. So, but the, you know, the outcome of so many people seeing it and, and also, not even just educating people, but people that have OCD. You know, I, th- I think that it, it, it resonated with them so much and it made just as much of an impact on people, on edu- on, on people with OCD than it did without. Yeah. Uh, because then, you know, I, my favorite, my favorite thing is when, you know, I get random Twitter messages or, or Facebook or Instagram messages about, Hello, watched your video. Um, I have I, I, I struggle with blah 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 blah. This A B, and that's my favorite thing. Even if it's just one person, like every two months, I get a message like that, and it's like, wow, like they, 
they they watched that video and, and were thinking to themselves like, wow, I struggle with this. They mm-hmm. felt that connection. That's my favorite thing because like, you know, in my faith, like, you know, connection is everything, you know, you know, that's, you know, that's God's love. You know, that's for me, that's, yeah. that's them feeling that connection and feeling safe and feeling and feeling like they're not, you know, the odd man out or they're not isolated. That that's, I, I to me, that's my favorite part. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, and what I'll do is in the show notes of this episode, I will link to these documentaries. So people can check them out that way as well. Yeah, that'd be great. No worries, man. Um, and you mentioned it there. Uh, you did, in fact, win the ISDF Hero <laughs> Award in 2019 for, for, yeah. ad, for your services to advocacy. Um, yeah, just anything else you wanted to share on that, like what it was like getting it. Um, yeah, just any any thoughts. Yeah. Um, it was uh, it was such a blessing and an honor. You know, I I the IOCDF my fa- they're like family now to me you know i i love them um they've had my back through the whole situation that i went through in college um they were always advocating for me always standing by me um because they know i do the same for them mm-hmm. and you know they it's such a it's such a caring organization and it was i mean i was kind of shell shocked when i got the the letter that i had won it and then that night um, of the award ceremony, uh, you know, that speech was, I, I it was all just such a blur that night. <laughs> um, but I mean, that was probably the most people I've ever talked to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was nerve wracking, but just, it was such a, a, such a special moment for my parents, my family. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, standing up there, you know, it, it just made you think like, wow, like, like seven years ago, like I was in there in some of the, their shoes and like I was watching, um, like a few years before that, you know, I'm really good friends with Chris Tronson yeah. and he had won the hero award. And I remember that was the first time I saw the hero award, uh, ceremony and was with him. And I, I just flashback to that and I was like wow like hmm. how much t- it just it made you it made you reflect so much um made me reflect so much about how how special this journey has been even though there have been so many hard times and so much to overcome this the special people I've met along the way have made it all worth it yeah. and the people I've I've positively affected but at the end of the day you know when I'm not on this planet anymore I want my legacy to be every life I touch I positively affected right that's that's the goal. And, um, one way or another, I want to, I want to make sure I'm affecting people in a positive way and, and, and educating. And, um, you know, that was a night that kind of celebrated the work I've done so far. And, mm-hmm. and I was really, really honored, uh, to, to even be standing up there. Um, but you know, even, even standing up there, I mean, I, I don't feel like a hero, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of, uh, and I don't want people to think of me here. You know, I want, I wanted with my speech, you know, I had mentioned in my speech, like the people around me were the heroes. They, they were the people helping me. They were the people there for me the whole time. And then the people that have OCD, that were at the conference that made it to the conference that decided to get, get up out of bed, conquer their OCD fly across the country, drive, whatever, to get to that conference to, to better themselves with their OCD and start their recovery. You know, that they would, those people, they thought I was a hero standing on the stage, but my heroes were the people that I was looking at talking to them, Yeah. you know? So that, that, I think that was probably the most special moment knowing that like, you know, some people were looking at me that way, but really in reality, I was looking at the people mm. that I was talking to that way. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome and uh yeah you know i was there that night and i saw the speech it was very moving and um yeah it's you you deserve it so thank you thank you so much yeah um okay so next question is uh just words of hope for anyone listening with ocd yeah i mean i'm sure they hear this all the time but it gets better you know but it's not but 
I will say it's not going to get better until you put the work in to get get it better. Mm. You know, I mean, whether you want to do that work or not, it's necessary work like we had talked in, begin- in the beginning of the show. Um, and then the other words of, words of hope is that you're not alone. There's so many resources, um, whether they're around you physically or online. There's so many different resources for help with OCD and related mental illness. You know, use your resources and understand that you're not alone in the struggle. There's so many people here to support you, and um, but it can get better, and it will if you if you attack therapy, if you attack the ER the exposure response therapy, talk to a psychiatrist, maybe get some medication, whatever. Whatever your treatment method is that works for you, best for you, it it is definitely possible to to live a life that is worth living and that is uh, functional and that you that you enjoy getting up up out of bed in the morning and going to going to work or going to you know whatever whatever it is that you like to do you know you can have your time back and you can, it's it's never going to be easy you know I to this day I don't think it's easy. But it's it. I'm able, you know. I'm and I'm able to see the beauty in things. I'm able to. I'm able to see. Uh, I'm able to enjoy different things. It it can get better, mm. and definitely, definitely check out the IOCDF website because so many resources. There's probably support groups around where where wherever you're living. Um, there's different uh, online resources, like I said. So definitely use your resources, and I think educate somebody. You know, educate one person at a time. Join us in in trying to break down that stigma. So I was going to ask you, sort of, if you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self, what would you tell him? <laughs> but I'm going to change that back a couple years because you talked about your 20 year old self earlier. So uh, you, let's say you pick up the phone and call your 18 year old self. What would you tell him? Well, one, I would tell him he doesn't have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even if I didn't have OCD, I would probably tell him that anyways. Mm. Um, listen to your parents more. <laughs> uh, but Two, I would tell them, you know, enjoy the moment and and enjoy the process of getting better. Mm-hmm. I know enjoy is kind of a weird word to say when you're debilitated by mental illness, but but don't don't harp on what the on exposures that you didn't get to do. So so I like this quote a lot. Uh, it's don't celebrate victories, celebrate overcoming defeats. And I think so many times in therapy, I would, I was so mad at myself that, that I wouldn't get far because I was, I didn't get, I didn't do well on an exposure. I wasn't where I wanted to be because I was comparing myself to others. Um, so I guess what I would really tell my, my 18 year old, 18 year old self is that your journey is your journey. You know, so, so many times today, in our society, there's a certain timeline that you have to follow that everybody has. You go to college, you get a job, you do this, you do that, you get married. Your journey will, everything will happen when it's supposed to happen. Mm. And you have to, to keep working hard and, and trust that, that your journey has a specific timeline. Like I, I'm a firm believer that God made my journey a certain way that, that my timeline is, is unique to me. Right. Things are going to happen at a, at a certain pace or in a certain way that might not be as as quickly as other people that you know other people from my high school that already have jobs and careers and and are already and weren't as set back by mental illness or or anything else you know they they didn't have those setbacks but my understand that you can't compa- compare yourself to them you know mm. your your journey was unique and it's a great journey. So in, enjoy that journey and, and love every moment of it because, you know, you're meeting so OCD may have caused so much anxiety and so much distress over the years and still does, but you're meeting so many people along the way and impacting so many lives that it's so worth it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So understand, but you know, your timeline is your timeline. You create your own, you know, um, idea of when you need to accomplish things, you know, don't, don't look at others and think I have to be here by this age, you know, just, I think just patience, you know, patience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Um, and, uh, you've got a, a billboard near where you live. What do you want written on that billboard? Uh, I am a face of OCD. Mm. You know, I, I I liked what the IOCDF did with the real uh, real OCD, the Faces of OCD campaign. Yeah. Um, I think having that on a billboard would be powerful because people know me, and s- some people don't know I have OCD. You know, some people, and if I didn't tell them, or if I wasn't an advocate, you know. I wonder if people would know because I hide it and just knowing that like people with mental illness are quote unquote normal, you know, like we're, we're people too, you know, it's not, Mm. our differences don't make us not normal. I mean, first of all, I don't, normal people accomplish normal things. I don't want to be normal. Yeah. I know I been I was told in college to be normal and I, I didn't like that, (laughs) but like we are humans too is what I mean, you know, my, I am a fa- this is a face of mental illness, but but you don't look tired or or depressed or mm. yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm I'm not struggling, you know. So yeah. it's important to realize that you know so many people are struggling with different different difficulties and disabilities that we don't even know about. You know, everybody has something going on in their lives, and just to realize that like on the surface things can look great, but deep down. They, they could be struggling too. So just be sympathetic towards, um, just be sympathetic and empathetic towards, uh, people that might have things going on in their life that you don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I love that. And is, is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that you wish you could have shared today? Um, not, not specifically. Um, I think that, you know, again, being on this po- podcast, you know, is such an honor to me because, you know, I look back at seven years ago and and realizing, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to log on to my computer then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, it's almost like uh, another another benchmark of refle- reflection to me, knowing that, uh, you know, I, I'm on this podcast now and I'm, I'm able to, to, to reach an audience that was that was me seven years ago, you know? Um, so that's, that's really important to me and I just really appreciate it. I appreciate it, mate. Um, and it's an honor to be able to, to, to speak with you and share that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. Um, and like I said, you fully deserve the hero award. So well thank done. you so much. So there you have it. Thank you so much for Thomas for his time. And of course, to you guys for listening. And don't forget today's episode is sponsored by NoCD. To find out more about NoCD and their therapy plans, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or visit the link in the episode description. Quick disclaimer, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care. Mm-hmm.